Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. This is episode 12, the story of Dennis Doherty, an extraordinary 19th century life of survival. The story of Dennis Doherty is a forgotten tale of one of the 19th century's most remarkable Irish convicts. His life is an almost unbelievable story of survival in brutal 19th century Australian prisons, where he endured floggings, solitary confinement and much more. This is the first of a new type of podcast I will be releasing. These shorter, more frequent shows, based on articles from my blog, irishhistorypodcast.ie, will come out while I'm preparing the more in-depth shows on medieval history. In 1872, the famed 19th century writer, Anthony Trollope, while researching his book, Australia and New Zealand, visited Port Arthur Prison in Tasmania. There he met and interviewed a 58-year-old prisoner who warders described as thoroughly bad, irredeemable, a beast of prey against whom it was necessary every honest man should raise their hand. The prisoner, of whom a photograph survives from this period, appeared in front of Trollope, his face wizened by years of incarceration and ill-treatment, having lost the use of an eye in an attempted escape. The prisoner told Trollope a story of his life, one of struggle against the brutal prison system where he had been flogged 3,000 times and served years in solitary confinement. But yet he had survived. This supposedly irredeemable man was Dennis Doherty and by the end of the interview Trollope had sympathy for his life and from hearing his story, as we shall find out now, one could not but feel some level of compassion for Doherty. The story of Dennis Doherty began over half a century earlier in Derry, Ireland, where Doherty was born in 1814. His childhood was shaped by an emerging economic, political and social tornado that was brewing in Ireland at the time. The crisis had begun in earnest in 1815, a year after Dennis Doherty's birth. In 1815, the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, while this was eulogised by many, few realised what it meant for Ireland. With Napoleon's defeat, trade between England and the continent resumed, and this resulted in a collapse in the price of foodstuffs produced in Ireland, and peasant farmers were hit hard. Now, if this wasn't enough, when Dennis Doherty was only ten years old, his face, and indeed to a certain extent the face of an entire generation, was sealed when a death blow was dealt to the economy in Ireland. The Act of Union, which had been introduced in 1800, had seen Ireland fully incorporated into the United Kingdom. Clauses in the Act stipulated that the countries in the United Kingdom, Wales, England, Ireland and Scotland, would operate a free trade area between them, this free trade area, however, was not to be implemented for 40 years as the economy in Ireland needed time to adjust. However, this 40-year adjustment period was scrapped when the powerful free trade lobbyists in Britain got the clauses enacted in 1824. This exposed Ireland's emerging industry to the might of British industry and the economy was devastated further still, plunging Ireland deeper into recession. These two hammer blows, the defeat of Napoleon and the Act of Union, sent Ireland's economy into a tailspin. Poverty was widespread and systematic. We get some glimpse of what Dennis Doherty's early years must have been like in a letter penned by the Duke of Wellington, himself an Irishman. In 1830 he noted, I confess that annually recurring starvation in Ireland occurs every year for that period of time that elapses between the final consumption of one year's crop of potatoes and the coming of the crop of the following year. However, we must expect that this evil will continue and will increase as the population will increase and the chances of a serious evil, such as the loss of a great number of persons by famine, will be greater in proportion to the numbers existing in Ireland 
in the state of which we now know the great body of people are living at the moment. While this letter was disturbingly prophetic, Dennis Doherty would not see the famine of 1845, the Duke of Wellington so accurately predicted in 1830. By the time Dennis Doherty was nearing adulthood in the 1830s, many people were escaping through emigration. Indeed, 1.5 million people emigrated in the three decades between the start of the recession in 1815 and the famine in 1845. For many young men, a cheap way of emigrating, and a guarantee of a steady, if dangerous job, was the British Army. After 1815, numbers from Ireland dramatically increased in the British Army, and by the 1830s, no less than 42% of the rank and file were recruited in Ireland. In Derry, with little opportunity, Dennis Doherty, along with two friends, William Moore and James O'Dea, joined the army in the early 1830s to escape what was a cycle of perpetual poverty, with little opportunity or any hope for the future. While the army sought out what they called spirited young fellows, Doherty, Moore and O'Dea would prove to be a little too spirited, as we shall see next. Very quickly it became apparent to these three men that they weren't suited to the harsh army life and tough discipline. The British Army operated a brutal regime in the early 19th century. Soldiers were treated extremely poorly and were frequently beaten and flogged. Indeed, within a few months, Doherty and O'Dea had received 300 lashes. What the exact infraction was is unrecorded, but obviously the two men had broken the austere army regulations. This punishment was excruciating, so much so that the victims often passed out with pain. The victim was strapped to an A-shaped frame in front of the soldiers in their regiment. The punishment was supposed to act as a deterrent to others. They were stripped to the waist or sometimes entirely naked. They were then flogged on the back or buttocks with a cat of nine tails a whip with nine smaller offshoots at its head, often laced with lead. This meant that each lash cut the victim nine times. The flogging was not only painful, it could be fatal. In 1846, a soldier in the British Army, John White, died after 150 lashes. By the time Dennis Doherty had been flogged 300 times, His back must have been completely covered in scars. After this brutal punishment, it's little surprise that these three young men, when they found themselves on the island of Guernsey, awaiting to be shipped to India, facing a life of army discipline, decided to desert. Guernsey was their last chance to desert, before they would be shipped far away to India. Unfortunately though, Guernsey is a tiny island a British outpost off the coast of France, and not the best place in the world to try and escape the clutches of an army. Nonetheless, Doherty, O'Dea and Moore decided they'd give it a try, and they made a run for it. However, being on an island only 30 miles square, it didn't take long before they were recaptured. They were brought before a court-martial to be punished for what was a very serious breach of military discipline. Dejected, they now faced punishment which could range from imprisonment to flogging. When the military court-martial was convened in March 1833, it found the three men guilty, but when it read out its verdict on Doherty, O'Dea and Moore, the three men must nearly have collapsed in shock. All three were dismissed from the army. O'Dea and Moore received seven years imprisonment, while Doherty received 14 years. All these sentences were to be served in Australia. Whatever about the punishment, the word Australia was devastating. Australia in the 19th century for most was a one-way trip. The only route to Australia from Europe was south around Africa, and across the Indian Ocean, a 15,000-mile trip 
that would take four or five months. After the sentence was handed down, as a final insult, they were almost certainly tattooed and branded with a D marking them out as deserters. Now getting prisoners from Europe to Australia wasn't an easy task. This was, after all, still the era of sale. The government held prisoners until sufficient numbers were awaiting transportation. In April, the three men, now convicts, were taken from Guernsey to a prison hulk at Gosport near Portsmouth Harbour. Prison hulks were decommissioned ships converted into prisons. On board this particular hulk, the York, around 500 prisoners were held. Conditions aboard were cramped and dark. Deep in the bowels of the ship, Doherty, O'Dee and Moore had three months to think about their misfortune. They were all still so young. O'Dee was the oldest at 30, while Moore and Doherty were only 21 and 19 respectively. But the lives they had once known were now effectively over. In July, the ship that would take them to Australia, the Aurora, arrived in Portsmouth. As Doherty and his friends were moved from the Hulk to the Aurora, this must have been a sobering moment. This was their last look at somewhat familiar surroundings. They would never see their families again, places they grew up, or their friends. On board, the bitter resentment felt by Doherty was no doubt similarly felt by many other prisoners. Another convict on the Aurora was a 16-year-old, George Morris from Wiltshire, who received 14 years for the crime of stealing 11 pieces of rope worth four shillings. As the Aurora set sail on the 4th of July, 1833, the desperation among the prisoners must have been palpable. Everything they had once known was changed and gone forever. The voyage in itself was epic, taking 122 days. For the likes of the three dairymen, the climates they moved through must have been unbearable. As they sailed south around Africa and across the equator in August, the temperatures would have soared into the 30s. When they encountered storms and the ship battled through high seas, this must have been absolutely terrifying. As they listened to the ship's timbers creak, the prisoners must have been all too well aware that locked below decks, had anything happened and the ship sank, they would certainly be drowned. However, the Aurora did make the trip safely, and on the 3rd of November, 1833, it arrived in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Already disorientated, having been taken to Australia, worse was to follow. O'Dee, Doherty and Moore soon lost the last connection to their past lives, their friendship. In Sydney, the three friends were split up and they never saw each other again. O'Dee served his seven years and disappeared into history. Moore was executed in 1838 for a stabbing. However, Dennis Doherty began what can only be described as a truly epic life, where he battled against the prison system at every turn. Doherty, in prison in Australia, no doubt felt a deep sense of injustice. He had joined the British Army to escape poverty, but had been horrifically brutalised, receiving 300 lashes, and then, after trying to escape, he was sentenced to 14 years, and not just anywhere, but in Australia, 15,000 miles from home. This alone would be enough to break most people, but in Australia aged only 19, he refused to accept his fate. Doherty resolved that he would be free and began a relentless pursuit of this goal and a battle against the prison authorities. The prison authorities, for their part, were equally resolute that Dennis Doherty would not escape. Indeed, 19th century prison systems enforced an absolute reign of terror over the prisoners, controlling every aspect of their lives, with strict regulations and brutal punishments. Any infraction was met with harsh physical discipline. In his first few years, 
Dennis Doherty tried to escape on no less than five occasions and this was dealt with ferociously. In 1834 he received 200 lashes, another 100 the following year and 270 in 1836. Incredibly though, this seemed to have little effect. In the early months of 1837, now aged only 23, having been lashed nearly a thousand times in total, he escaped yet again, this time with a man called John McGuinness. Doherty and McGuinness were successful in getting away from the prison. In the Australian high summer, where temperatures hit the 40s, the two survived for months, engaging in bush ranging, which was essentially banditry. This was the first time Dennis Doherty had been free in nearly five years. But it wasn't to last. In May 1837, the two were caught. They were taken before a court-martial and were charged with robbery and other offences. Dennis Doherty was convicted and sentenced to death. However, this sentence was commuted to 20 years imprisonment. For Dennis Doherty, though, who craved freedom, this prison sentence must have seemed like a face worse than death when he found out where he was being taken to. He was no longer being held on the mainland in Australia. Instead, he was going to be shipped to the incredibly remote Norfolk Island, a dreaded penal colony in the middle of the Tasman Sea, lying north of New Zealand and east of Australia. In May 1837, Dennis Doherty was put on board yet another prison transport ship and began the 1,000-mile journey to Norfolk Island. Arriving on the island, it must have been abundantly and depressingly clear to Dennis Doherty that there would be no escape from this prison. Situated 550 miles from the nearest island, New Zealand, Norfolk itself was only four miles in length and four miles in width, and the regime was truly brutal. Despite this seeming lack of hope, Doherty refused to give in. For example, in May 1838, his record is astounding. The month began with Doherty being flogged 200 times for foul language and neglect. Less than three weeks later, no doubt, his back still raw from the whipping, he was put in double irons, a punishment which saw him locked in heavy chains for insubordination. And then, a week later, at the end of the month, he was locked up in his cell for two weeks for disorderly conduct. Indeed, before the year was out, Doherty would be lashed another 250 times. In spite of this, he seemed unbreakable. The following year, he continued to resist and received 400 lashes. By this stage, Doherty's back must have been completely and utterly scarred. In the years between 1833 and 1839, he was flogged somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 times. This must have been having a serious impact on his overall health. And no doubt, when a major change occurred in the prison system at Norfolk, Doherty welcomed the respite from brutalisation that accompanied it. In March 1840, a penal reformer, Alexander McConaughey, took over the prison at Norfolk. McConaughey believed in rewarding prisoners and reduced the amount of corporal punishment so much so that it appears from the records that Dennis Doherty was not flogged at all in 1840. Flogging or no flogging though, Doherty never gave up on his goal to be free. In Norfolk Island, hundreds of miles of sea made this impossible. To have any hope, he had to get off Norfolk before he could think of escaping. In 1841, now 27, Doherty feigned madness and was moved from Norfolk back the thousands of miles to Sydney, where he was incarcerated in a mental asylum. Now, 19th century mental asylums were brutal places, but Doherty, having survived prisons that would kill many, probably found it easy going. Back on the mainland, he could escape, and within a few months, Doherty had absconded. 
and began robbing to survive. After robbing the Goulburn mail train, he was recaptured and sentenced this time to Port Arthur Prison in Tasmania. Four years later, however, in 1845, he was due to be sent back to Norfolk Island. Being put aboard the transport vessel the Governor Philip, Doherty was in desperation. In many ways, this must have seemed like the end of the line. If he was returned to Norfolk, escape would have been impossible. He was never going to be able to con his way off a second time. As usual, Dennis Doherty was unwilling to accept his fate, and he attempted to instigate a mutiny on the ship. This failed, and Doherty received yet another prison sentence. This must have been one of the darkest moments of his life, where even the unbreakable Doherty must have felt like the game was up. But nevertheless, he struggled on and wouldn't give in. When he arrived on Norfolk Island, Doherty found the reformer, McConaughey, had been replaced by the brutal John Price, who reinstated a harsh regime. Ideas about prison were changing and Doherty faced new challenges. Seemingly unbreakable through physical punishment, he would now have to deal with solitary confinement. Continuing to resist, Doherty was in and out of solitary confinement on Norfolk Island almost constantly, but he never relented, refusing to submit to John Price and his brutal regime. Indeed, the author, Robert Pringle Stewart, having observed prisoners on Norfolk in 1846, described Doherty as a ringleader. How he kept himself going is remarkable. With little hope of ever getting off the island, he nevertheless refused to give in. In 1853, however, Doherty's situation was dramatically transformed by a policy decision in London. That year, the British government decided transportation of prisoners to Australia was to stop. Norfolk Island now served little purpose, being logistically very difficult to maintain due to its remote nature. Doherty and the other inmates were boarded on transports and shipped back to Australia. This time, Doherty was brought to Tasmania, a large island slightly smaller than Ireland, 150 miles south of Australia. Two years later, as Doherty was coming to the end of his sentence, he was released to work on farms near the prison. Although a more relaxed regime, it wasn't freedom, and unsurprisingly, in 1856, Dennis Doherty escaped again. Returning to the only life available to him, he engaged in bush ranging. And it seems that during this period, in 1856, Doherty, having teamed up with another prisoner, was involved in the murder of a colonist, George Sturgeon. Doherty fled Tasmania, but it appears he was well known at this stage and he was caught within a few months. For Doherty, this must have been heartbreaking. He was not only being returned to captivity, but now he faced a trial where he was going to be charged with murder and a death sentence was highly likely. He was convicted and sentenced to death. But miraculously, for the second time in his life, Dennis Doherty escaped the hangman's noose and the death sentence was commuted. However, this time, Doherty was put in what was arguably the most difficult prison he ever faced. While Doherty had survived lashings and beatings on Norfolk Island, what he was put through next was arguably worse. He was incarcerated in Port Arthur in Tasmania, where a so-called model prison had been recently opened. The design and regime was based around a perverse notion of reforming the prisoners. This involved essentially breaking the individuals down. In order to do this, prisoners were kept in almost constant isolation. When they mixed with other prisoners, they could not come within 4.5 metres of each other and had to wear a cloth mask covering their face. They were never referred to by anything other than their prisoner number. The greatest result of this regime 
was, unsurprisingly, that many prisoners went insane. Indeed, studies showed that prisoners in these prisons had an increased chance of losing their sanity, given the amount of time they had to spend on their own. However, even this regime couldn't break Dennis Doherty. In 1863, he was released from the model prison back to the normal prison at Port Arthur. During the following nine years, Doherty battled away against the prison authorities. His infractions were less frequent, but nonetheless, he just didn't give in. In 1871, Doherty made one last attempt at freedom. Aged 58, he escaped with George Fisher and John O'Brien. But this time, he wasn't physically able for the rough life in the bush. When he was captured, he was almost dead from starvation. In this escape, Doherty also lost the sight of his left eye. He was returned to prison for a while in Hobart Jail and then Port Arthur, both in Tasmania. Much of this time he spent in solitary confinement. It was after this escape that Anthony Trollope visited Port Arthur and interviewed Dennis Doherty. Trollope, who lived in Ireland in the 1840s, had sympathy for Doherty's plight. It was during the course of the interview that Dennis Doherty revealed to Trollope that he was finally broken by that last escape. Perhaps, though, it was his age, rather than the prison system, that had finally broken him. It was Trollope who made Doherty famous when an account of the interview was published in his book Australia and New Zealand in 1873. In 1874, Doherty was photographed by the police photographer Thomas J. Nevin and this picture reveals a face that tells Doherty's story in its worn, haunting look. If you go to irishhistorypodcast.ie, the picture is there. It's really worth a look. In 1876, it appears the prison authorities were satisfied that Doherty, now aged 62, was broken because he was given a ticket of leave. This allowed Doherty to live outside the prison and he enjoyed most freedoms. Thirty years earlier he would no doubt have absconded. But it appears that Doherty was beyond all that in 1876. He was an old man. He had spent three quarters of his life in prison after a foolish move in 1833 back in Ireland. When he was released in 1876, the world he had grown up in was gone. In Hobart, Tasmania, Doherty would no doubt have seen large numbers of Irish people and he perhaps began to realise the true extent of what had happened in Ireland when he had been incarcerated. The famine had ravaged the society he had grown up in and no doubt killed many of his friends and family. The world was changing fast in the 1870s. The telegram had been invented, electricity was beginning to be used and technological revolutions were just starting to transform everyday life. What happened to Dennis Doherty after this is not known. It's hard to see him surviving long in a society where he had spent so long in prison. The physical regime he had endured must have also had an impact on his health. His life was nonetheless incredible and perhaps the best way to end this story is with his own words. When interviewed by Anthony Trollope in 1872, he explained his life and actions in prison with the words, I have tried to escape, always to escape, as a bird does out of a cage. Is that unnatural? Is that a crime? If you want to read more about the life of Dennis Doherty, or just see the picture of Doherty himself, don't forget to check out the website irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, Sloan.